everybody, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is a daily show where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us, as always, is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also here, John Schnapp. Just want to let you know, I, I am not drinking Green Mountain coffee right now. <laughs> <laughs> also, here's Christian Harloff. I want to be a DJ. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, have to be around for a thing. And apparently, hold, I got to mention this. Apparently, okay, everybody knows there's this thing called Force Friday coming. That, what is it, September 9th? Friday, September 4th. Uh, September, 4th. 4th. September 4th, right. September 4th. And that's when all the these stores can start releasing these new The Force Awakened toys, blah, blah, blah. Kmart decided to be sneaky little bastards. And they accidentally <laughs> put the toys out. What was it, your buddy who was that? Yeah, at a friend it? of mine, Bill, uh, somehow wandered into a Kmart, probably like what he regularly does, like snooping around in the children's aisle looking for like strange <laughs> toys, which we all want. Um, and he found all these Star Wars Force Awakens toys. So he took pictures, he posted them all on uh, Facebook, and then he bought, he was actually able to buy a bunch of them. They're not supposed to sell them, but. I guess the manager was out. They did a price check. He actually got him for less than he was well, supposed how, to even How about for. you give him some of that Green Mountain coffee? And then, <laughs> go, and then we go rob his house. That's right. I was like, yo, get me a Kylo Ren. He said, they're all gone. I was like, oh. <laughs> well, hey, listen, guys. You know, every couple of weeks, because we get so many email questions from you guys, we like to take an episode of Movie Talk and try to catch up with some of those email questions, at least as best as we can. So we got a couple of items that we do have to cover today, and then we're going to get into a whole bunch of mailbag questions. So, Ashley, why don't you start us off? As many of you know, a major Star Wars The Force Awakens cover feature is coming in the next issue of Empire Magazine, and a major point in that article has been released. In the story, J.J. Abrams has confirmed that Kylo Ren, the apparent villain of the new Star Wars film, is in fact not a Sith. The director also goes on to reveal that Ren works directly under Supreme Leader Snoke, who is a powerful figure on the dark side of the Force. Supreme Leader Snoke is a motion capture character in the film, being played by Andy Serkis. Christian, what's your reaction? to Abrams comments I love them and I think that about three two three weeks ago we actually got this question on Jedi Council yeah I mean it's the title of the episode was will Kylo Ren be a Sith and I think all three of us said no um, because it just it seems like they've been teasing if you're not watching the, the show Rebels it just seems like they've been teasing these Inquisitors and 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 they even said that he was going to parallel Luke almost on the uh, the anti Luke yeah, yeah. To, so he's got to he's going to earn it whether or not he's going to be a Sith I don't know but as of right now it makes sense that he's not now as far as Snoke it just adds up more and more speculation of who this guy's going to be what he's done um, how powerful he is in the dark side of the force and I love how much detail and effort is going into all these characters and that's what we've always wanted with Star Wars that's what we wanted with the new retelling of Star Wars I love how mysterious they've been with Andy Serkis's character he's the one guy him and for a long time don't Gleason, you didn't see him. You're seeing more of him now. There's two people now you haven't seen a lot of, and that's Andy Serkis, which mm -hmm. you're getting a little snip here, and Max von Sydow is nowhere to be found. Right. So those two guys, uh, I'm looking forward to. And Spider Man. And Spider Man actually yeah. does have a cameo in this. Movie. Yeah. Right. He's a DJ. very small cameo. Yeah, he's a DJ in the movie. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what What is interesting about the discussion too about whether Kylo Ren was going to be a Sith? I mean, none of us thought he would, but you could see why some people suspected that maybe he could. I mean, he's you know he's got the mask, wearing black, and wielding a red lightsaber. Of course, there's there's reason there to suspect that perhaps he is. But we all thought that he wasn't. I mean. Look, it, it, the Sith are gone. They, there was only two, Master and Apprentice, and they both got wiped out on the same day. So that makes it tough. But I did was starting to wonder if um, Supreme Leader Snoke was going to be... Look, if you look on the Rebel side of things, right? you had Jedi. Or let, let's look at the Republic. You had Jedi, but ultimately they worked for the Republic. They were there to defend the Republic, and they answered to the Supreme Chancellor, right? Who was not a Force user. And I started to wonder, well, maybe Supreme Leader Snoke is like that on the opposite side. He's not a force leader, uh, a force user, but he is the big guy on the totem pole. And these new dark uh, force users, not Sith, answer to him. But apparently he is quite powerful on the dark side of the force. So that is something brand new. That brings up a whole new set of questions that I'm sure we're going to go into on Jedi Council. Um, that is really quite fascinating. If I had a dollar. If I had a dollar. Yeah, if I had a, yeah I know where <laughs> that's going. Um, and so now the other thing that this answers is we debated and discussed on Jedi Council a little bit is are there different 
uh, factions of these guys. Does Kylo Ren not have anything to do with the First Order? Maybe he's, he's his own thing. And then we saw stormtroopers with him, but maybe there are different types of stormtroopers. Now that's set to rest. He works directly for Supreme Leader Snoke. So that is something new that we now know for absolute fact. A lot of interesting stuff coming out of this. What was your reaction I'm to this? I'm just interested to find out what uh, Snoke looks like. Because like in my mind, I keep seeing that character from the old Battlestar Galactica 1980 series, the mysterious leader. He's got like a weird octopus yes. head. Or just something I would love, it, because it's a motion capture character, I would love it to not be a biped. I would love it to be like some kind of a creature. You know, that would just be, I'm sure it'll be a biped, but you know, if when I say biped, I mean somebody who's human looking with walking around with two legs, yeah, two, walks on two legs, two arms. If I get my way and he's who I hope he is and the characters like the species will get super sweaty. Now the species called is called immune uh, uh -huh. and they're part of like the like banking clans and stuff, too. So that he could play if, if they do stick with what Darth Plagueis was. And if he eventually turns out to be that character and it is immune, it'd be very interesting because they're, they're tall, they're scaly, they're kind of pale um, and they could be menacing. So um, I'd be interested to see exactly who he turns out to be. I know I know like, uh, you know, just around the Internet, they've been talking about, you know, Kylo Ren is from the Order of Ren. The Knights of Ren. The Knights, Knights of Ren. Of Ren. Yeah. So, and but I, that sounds like, you know, they were like saying it, the Ren, Ren is like a Darth. It's just like a name. So it is. And I heard I mean, and I won't say it now because I don't want to spoil, but I heard a crazy rumor about what the Knights of Ren are. And I and I trust me, I want to say it, but I just it, it, it sounds like a big they're a glorified group of Vader groupies. I mean, they, when you read really, when you read right? the J J. Abrams' description of them, they're basically a big group of Vader groupies, and I mean that in the best way possible. But for whatever reason, when I think of Snoke, I have no reason for this. But whenever I do, you know what I picture in my head? It's not even a show I watch. You know that animated show by um, Seth, um, who's the guy who does Family Guy? Seth uh, MacFarlane. Seth MacFarlane. Oh. That other show he does, American Dad? Sure. You know there's that, there's that little gray alien? Yeah. I, for whatever uh, reason, that's what I see in my head when I think of Supreme Leader Snoke, and I have no idea why that. Please why make that, that not be what he looks like, <laughs> <laughs> or have that exact same voice. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Hey, Ren. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that would not be good. Hi, All right, folks. Hey, listen, since it's Tuesday, it's for us to talk about what's opening this week, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Two wide-release films coming out this week, and we're going to start off today by talking about one of them, the brand-new Zac Efron film, We Are Your we Friends. We Are Your Friends. Ashley, tell us a little bit about it. This week, we start off by talking about the new Zac Efron film, We Are Your Friends. Young Cole Carter, played by Efron, dreams of hitting the big time as a Hollywood disc jockey, spending his days and nights hanging with buddies and working on the one track that will set the world on fire. Mm. Opportunity comes knocking when he meets James Reed, a character charismatic DJ who takes the 23-year-old under his wing. Soon, his seemingly clear path to success gets complicated when he starts falling for his mentor's girlfriend, jeopardizing his new friendship and the future he seems destined to fulfill. John, are you looking forward to We Are Your Friends? No. <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, you know, I want to be looking forward to it because I am a Zac Efron fan. I'm a Zac Efron defender. Um, but nothing about these... No, the movie could turn out to be great. I'll let Christian address that in a second. The movie could turn out to be great and everything, but the trailers have been awful. These just look like a group of awful guys, um, awful, lazy guys. And I'm sorry, but when I see in a trailer, oh, this guy's getting a break, being took under the wing by some guy, and he's going to start banging his girlfriend in... I why do I want to watch a story about this douchebag? I'm not really sure. So I have not seen it yet. I had the opportunity to go and see it the other night, and surprisingly, I turned it down. But um, personally, I'm not looking for it. Before we get to the one guy at the table who has seen the movie, Schnepp, your anticipation of what do you think we're going to get out of My anticipation friends? is so low from the trailers. The trailers just like just looked uh, vapid, like a silly music video. Uh, with elements of everything that we've seen before from Saturday Night Fever to Gem and the Holograms to everything, <laughs> things that just don't interest me on any level. And I mean, maybe if I was 16, uh, I would really want to see this movie. So maybe, uh, you know, this is your inner 16 moment. So, well, Christian, you had a, the, the chance to see We Are Your Friends last night, I believe. And I think our own uh, Wendy Lee also saw it, Cindy, back there. She got to see it, too. Um, so should we be rushing out to see We Are Your Friends? Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> Painful. 
Schnapp, you lit- you just reviewed the movie. You did <laughs> the, everything that you saw from the trailer. That's wow. exactly you. Like you could have lied and said you saw it and reviewed it that way, and you and I would be like, okay, yeah, he saw it Whoa. because it is a music video. It is Zac Efron, who I am also a fan of. I think the guy can act. Um, me and Orson Welles, neighbors, yeah, he had the yeah. comedy chops. Plus, he's almost 30 years old. Why is he playing a 22, 23-year-old? This is a role he should have played like five, six years ago. He shouldn't have played this role. It's because he's trying to get better roles. Why jump into this garbage? Because that's exactly what it is. And I don't even know what the story is. It's so I mean, you literally you put all these cliches together, and some of the acting is just so bad. And you're right, John. That's the whole point. of the, the When you're watching this, you're going... I only am rooting for him at all because it's Zac Efron. This is not a good dude. He's not. And I don't care. Voice over. This is why you should like me. Take your voice over and go listen to and the, the trees. And the story's not good enough to follow no. a not good dude. No, it's not. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it, and the director is to blame for this one. Sometimes you can say, oh, the act is. The directing and the writing, but the directing mostly like to, in order to get away from certain scenes, it's like a montage with, with the music. And granted, it's a DJ movie, but it's like, it, you felt it going, oh, we need to transition. Here's a music video. And it feels like it's two hours and 15 minutes. It's like an hour 40. I got out of there going, oh, how long was that movie? I'm like, an hour 40? What? It's, it is a waste of time, and, and I really hope Zac Efron can recover from it. But isn't this, this is also one of those films where it's sort of like every single person I know and their dad and mom are DJs right now? <laughs> it's just like it's a thing. Everyone's right. a DJ. That's what I was hoping for. Because you get that app on your iPhone. Yeah, it's just so you know, man, I'm rocking this side thing. I'm a DJ now. It's a, and I have nothing against every single person on the planet being a DJ because I like having music played for me. It has and nothing mixed to do for me. The, not, yeah, the bad it has nothing to do with it. It's no, a DJ. But movie. what I'm saying, though, is like the way that the even the trailers are like, man, we got to get out of this place. I'm living in this hellhole. There's no way for us to do anything. Right. We're stuck in horrible, meaningless jobs. The answer, be a DJ? No, you that know, everyone well, is already a DJ. The one thing that they throw a job at, John Barenthal's in this movie, and he is put in this 99 cent version of Wolf of Wall Street and Boiler Room, which is oh. so silly and has, has no reason <laughs> should be in the movie. But the DJ part, I wanted to see more of. It's like the only time you see him actually being a DJ is in montages and like a quick thing in the beginning. And at the very end, if they would have done what they did with the end and put that as the whole movie and seeing him kind of evolve <laughs> with his career, I, have not, I, I was actually fascinated with the stuff like, okay, what is the world? Right. The DJ, but then it's a silly side story with the friends and the and and the girlfriend who is really sexy and good actress. By the way, she was she's a pretty she's pretty natural. But again, it's the only good movie she's been in so far is is Gone Girl. Let me ask you this: uh, as somebody who, who saw the movie, um, a lot of people because there was a DJ theme to the movie, the scenes where he's DJing and the part are those entertaining scenes. Well, will I mean, people the music- who are, who are for people who are going to see it because it is a DJ film, will they they be satisfied with those scenes and things like that? Uh, no, I don't think so because that's that's my point is the fact that they like when the I actually enjoy that type of music and I thought that the music when they played it was great. So if you enjoy the music, yes, that those portions of the movie you'll you'll, you'll be entertained by. But the problem is that him trying to inspire to be this DJ, you don't really get the feel of him. Work. Like there's a great scene of him listening and understanding what Wes Bentley was teaching him, and then trying to incorporate that into DJ. I'm like, okay, that's cool. It's almost like an eight mile spin on it, mm-hmm. but it doesn't happen until way later, and it's it's more about him just goofing around. I can't even tell you what the movie's about. So before he steals Wes's girlfriend, he steals his techniques. No, it's, it, well, he lists, yeah, it's like he tells him, he's like, you never listen, man. You're so wrapped up in the technology and everything else. And then it's like, and then he's got the dopey friends who get, and then they throw in unnecessary drama just to have the drama. It's a slop house. Ugh. All right. Well, there you have it. We will cover the other film that is opening up this week, No Escaped, on Thursday's installment of opening this week. But as I said, today we're going to spend most of the day just talking your mailbag question. So if you've got a topic or a question you'd like addressed on the show or on our weekend mailbag show, you can email us to collidervideo at gmail.com. We get to as many as we can. So Ashley, what are we starting off with today? JR the King writes, my question is about the original Twilight Zone and the amount of movies that have taken concepts from this amazing show. Since I discovered the show two years ago, I have noticed that many of the episodes resemble many well-known feature films such as Child's Play, The Sixth Sense, Clock Stoppers, The Kid, Liar Liar, Real Steel, and Poltergeist, just to name a few. So my question is, am I giving the Twilight Zone too much credit for all of these ideas? Or if I'm not, how much do you guys think that the Twilight Zone has influenced major feature films and what are your guys thoughts on the twilight zone thanks well i remember 
I, I th the answer is yes and no. I mean, because I do remember the original film of uh, Child's Play and one of the filmmakers talking about that episode of Twilight Zone. And if you don't know the episode of Twilight Zone that I'm talking about, it is one of the freakiest 25 minutes or whatever it is you could spend in front of your television with the lights turned off. And this is old 50s black and white thing. And it's about this mean alcoholic dad. And he's got a little girl who's got a doll. And the doll starts to talk. And I'm actually getting freaked the hell out just thinking about the episode. It is, <laughs> it doesn't run around and wield the knife. It's just, you know, my name's Molly and I'm your friend. And other things, my name's Molly. You should be nicer. What the hell? Then finally, later near the end of the episodes, my name's Molly, and I'm going to kill you. And it's like, and I'm just—it sounds so simple, mm -hmm. but it was the simple techniques of Twilight Zone. There was, oh my, look at look at my arms, <laughs> look at my arm. That, I'm just getting freaked out about it. They, that was so effective. I challenge anybody to watch that episode of Twilight Zone at night with the lights off. But that being said, it's. Not every Twilight Zone that bears some similarity to a modern film has actual direct roots. I mean, if you watch enough I Love Lucy, you can probably find some connections between other episodes. And they weren't necessarily influenced by that particular episode, but there are certainly some. And I know that the Child's Play one is one of them. Anyway, Christian. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that it's it's a very inspirational show for a lot of filmmakers. And I think as over the time, I mean, it, it was one of those shows that, it, it, like you said, it's in the 50s. People still talk about it today. And I know that there's been other um, versions of it throughout the years, but there's a reason why. It's because it, it did have such an impact. And I think that it was one of the more creative shows of all time. You watch some of those old Twilight, and they still hold up because they're so, it, it was so ahead of its time, I think. So, yeah, I think it's inspired many, many films, but I agree with you 100%. I think there's also sometimes similar ideas are similar ideas. And sometimes the person who did it first. You know, gets the gets should get the credit for it, but there are sometimes you think of the same ideas anyway. It's a great question. I love the Twilight Zone. I grew up watching that series. They aired them back to back, double episodes of the Twilight Zone. <clears throat> it's a fantastic series for so many reasons. Rod Serling basically mined all of these incredible '40s and '50s short stories that were were pulp novels of of, of, of their time, and he he would take those and adapt them. He basically wrote almost all of the first season and many episodes of the following two seasons. And other incredible screenwriters like Richard Matheson, a bunch of different people started writing for the Twilight Zone. A ton of actors you'll see them first in the Twilight Zone, like William Shatner. He's in two of two of the best Twilight Zone episodes, playing different characters. It's a it's something that I miss from modern television right now, which is the anthology series. Yeah, I was going to say that. Which we don't have anymore, and it's something that I would love to see come back. I mean, the the closest we have is American Horror Story. Every season, it's a different story, but it's like the anthology series allowed you to have these short form little mini episodes. A good example to serve man, one of the most frightening Twilight Zone episodes you'll ever see. Guess what that turned into? V, the TV series V. They just simply adapted that. And then years later, they live, and all these other all these other uh, movies and, and TV shows are inspired by the Twilight Zone. So inspiration comes from all these different things. Rod Serling was heavily inspired. I, I can think by of books. a movie talking about anthology, like short stories. I think of a little movie called ABCs of Death. Sure, that's kind of that, that anthology style horror Definitely. Thing. So yeah, I mean, there, uh, there are still some anthologies that come out, you know, but it's like it's not like a prevalent thing like it was back in the time of you know the '60s, the '50s. We did they just or even like. Uh, what was that one that he did at right after that night gallery, you, you know, in the seventies. So the anthology series was still around in the seventies and eighties and it kind of petered out. I'd love to see it come back, but yeah, it's a great question because the twilight zone did inspire so many young writers and authors who then came, came into their own, like Steven Spielberg and all these other people who loved the twilight zone and then ended up making movies that are derived from some of their favorite Twilight Zone episodes. And for those of you who didn't know, Josh Schnepp was actually one of the directors on ABC's The Death. All right, what's next? Grant Peter writes, I was wondering what makes a film an American film or a British film, etc. What got me wondering was Chappie. When it was in release, people kept linking to IMDb slash wiki, and it gave a short intro saying, Chappie, an American film about, but the director is South African. Most of the actors are South African, with one Brit and one Aussie, and just Sigourney Weaver representing the States as far as I recall it's shot in south africa and it's based in south africa is it just american because the paychecks are from the u.s essentially you are correct sir yeah. essentially it's because ultimately who owns the movie who is making the movie 
the movie is made by the studio and the producers. And if, if they're American studios and producers, it doesn't matter if they shoot it in Fiji, it doesn't matter if they shoot it in Australia, whatever, it is an American film. At the same time, if you have a British production company that shoots something in Detroit, it is a British film. Um, so, because, you know, it's not about, oh, was the lead actor, nobody cares about where the actors are from, or, or, or who, you know, the, the editor, where's the editor from? Like, none of that's real. It's only about... You're right. Where did the paychecks come? Who may who actually put this movie together? And that's generally where it's from. A am I wrong? No, on no that? Yeah. totally. That's the right answer. That's an American-owned film set in South Africa. Yep. All right. Simple as that. All right. What's next? <laughs> Robert Clark writes, Hey, Collider crew, I was looking at the box office results for Avatar and was surprised to see a weekend opening of $77 million. I was even more surprised to see the second weekend total of $75.6 million, a decrease of only 1.8%. <laughs> How did Avatar achieve such a crazy low drop in gross? And did anyone see that coming? Uh, this is the single most remarkable thing about Avatar. And, and what a lightning in a bottle, once in a generation kind of thing it is. When we talk about a movie going from week one to week two, now remember, this isn't a situation where, oh, a movie opened in limited release, and then the following week it opened nationwide, and then so the box, no, no, no. Avatar opened nationwide uh, on December, I want to say 8th, but I, I can't remember exactly. Anyway, Avatar opened nationwide. We always say on here, it's really good if your film, it's a really good sign for your movie. If you go from week one to week two with less than a 50% drop, if you get like a 48% drop or something like that, that is considered, hey, that's really good. And if you get like a 70% drop, that's really bad. 1.8%. Get this. I did some more digging in the analytics. Between week one and week four, okay? Week four, it only dropped 30% from week one to week Four. That is less than any other movie drops from week one to week two. It And the other remarkable thing about that number that a lot of people are surprised at at first is that people think, well, Avatar, biggest movie of all time, clearly it made like $190 million opening weekend. No, it made like $77 million opening weekend. But then it kept going and kept going and kept going. And like I said, it is one of those once in a generation types of things. I honestly do not know. This is one of those things you always say, okay, that's a good record eventually. I don't know that we will ever see another movie again that opens wide in week one and has less than 2% drop to week two, especially in today's movie going on. It's where the biggest movie fans, they all want to rush out and see it week one. We all go, right. and so then you see a big drop week two. You know, 40% drop, that's awesome. I don't know that we will ever see that happen again. But I, I don't know, Schnepp, you look at these numbers. What stands out to you? This is this stands out. I mean, it's literally it's a, it is like, you know, it's a beacon like the, all the other films like I mean, we were just talking about Mission Impossible five and that dropped 31 percent in its third week. Yeah. And that was where we were like, hey, that's that just jumped back up to number two, you know, in, in the in the you know, we have like three new movies coming out. But then a movie from three weeks ago is in the right. in drop 30 percent from week two to week right. three, not that's from week meant, one yeah. to week three. Yeah. But that's still, you know, that's, you know, yeah. that's still really respectable. It's, re it's really great. But this is in, insane. And. And it really, it really comes out to word of mouth with Avatar. Because I remember I'm one of those people who saw it the second weekend. I didn't see it the opening weekend. And then everyone was like, it's incredible. You've got to see it. The 3D is fantastic. And I was going to see it anyway. But then it just forced me to like, I got to get a ticket immediately and see this. So I think word of mouth just built on Avatar from all the people chiming in about it's going to be a failure. Just like Titanic. James Cameron, I mean, a lot of people want to see this guy go down for some reason. I mean, all of his <laughs> films are always like, eh, this one's going to really suck. And then it's like, yeah, it just blew the doors off every <laughs> box office number you've ever seen. And, oh, here's another one, you know? So I don't know. I think, uh, I don't know if Avatar 2, whenever that comes out, will will have this kind of drop off or not. That's kind of an interesting thing. Is it fair to say, though, Christian, that one of the things that helped that 1.8% drop was the fact that it, only made $77 million opening weekend. Like if Avatar had made $150 million opening weekend, would we have seen a, a just a, a week two drop off of like 1.8%? No, no, absolutely not. There would have been a, a, a way bigger drop off if it was right. that big of an opening. And also remember that this is one of the conversations that we've had about Star Wars many times. Is right. that coming in December, there's only been one, there's never been a movie to crack 100 million. 
in December. Now, I think that'll change this December, but that's still, it's hard because you forget about weather and all those type of things that happen in the holiday season. Christmas time. All that. There's, there's a reason why a lot of movies don't open in that time. However, the reason why I think that it did well, you're absolutely right with 3D, because now we're, we're so beaten over the head with it. We're like, oh, another 3D movie. Right. Not only was it one of those movies that brought back 3D, it did bring it back. It was done well and shot for 3D, and it was an experience. And it's I actually, I actually still like Avatar very much. Mm -hmm. I know it's become kind of cool to hate on it now, and, and people don't like it in general. And it doesn't transfer as well as it did on the screen as it uh, does, you know, excuse me, on TV as it does on right. on the big screen. Because when you watch, there's on nothing the like that. Screen, it's crazy. It was Amazing. like going, it was even like in going, non 3D. It no, is a man, it's, it's visual. It's feast. beautiful. It's like going to. It was like going on a Universal uh, City yeah. ride or something like yeah. too. You were you were there. You were in it. You were those when the glasses. My wife who hates 3D had those glasses and enjoyed it because it was a matter of you felt like you were mm -hmm. there when you were falling down. You it was it was crazy. It was almost like virtual reality. It's it's riding on those dragons or whatever those weird bird creatures are. All that stuff. Yeah. And then yeah. that's what people were telling you when you get out of the theaters. Like you got to see it. It's not only a movie. And the story is you know it's, it's Pocahontas or whatever yeah. or Fern Gully, Dances with Wolves, whatever. But it, it's it's seeing it in that big theater and i think that's why the drop off for the second week was so small because people were had never seen anything like that it was very similar and they went told all the friends you told gotta everyone. come back and see it with like, me next week think about right. what happened no, when star true. wars came out in 77 they had never seen a movie like that there had mm -hmm. never been a movie like that to do what they did with special effects and avatar was groundbreaking as far as 3d and special effects so it was that same kind of conversation go and see it you gotta see it even if they want to go oh, it stinks but you can't deny it. even if you saw it in the theater even if you hate the movie, were you not blown away visually by the way that movie? It I, is an entertaining and movie. And it's almost three hours long. That's another right. thing. It's crazy it's long. Now, I was one of these guys. Like, I, I said it had no business, and it didn't win. I said it had no business winning Best Picture that year. But I was totally on board with it being nominated for Best Picture. Right. And it was very well cast. That's yeah. one of the things that people don't talk a lot about, about Avatar. And that's understandable because of the visual spectacle that it is. It was very well cast. All the people, they didn't go out and get the best actors in the world. They got great people who fit those roles. Mm -hmm. And fit them really, really well. Stephen Lang was a revelation. Oh of yeah. That yeah, too. I'm super stoked that he's coming back. He should play Cable. He yeah. should play Cable. He's the only guy I can yeah. possibly think of that would be a like great him. fit for Cable. But, uh, but honestly, well, let me ask you guys um, on a scale of percentages, and let me say, draw the line at forty percent. Okay, forty percent Schnepp. Over or under forty percent, the chances that we will ever see, again see a wide release movie. Drop by less than two percent from week one to week two. Wow. Well, two percent's rough. I mean, because basically what you guys just said. I mean, when you said you got to come back and see it with me, that that is that repeat business that didn't really happen again. Well, it's first started with Star Wars because as a little kid, that's the first movie that I had to beg my parents to see a third time. They didn't understand. You've seen it already in summer camp, and, my, and your sister took you to go see it. Why do you need to see it again? You don't understand. Like crying. <laughs> I have to see it. You have to see it with me. I was trying to convert my parents to the dark side. I was like, you know, you have to come with me. And they came with me, and they loved it, and they you know, liked it or whatever. But that's that, that you cannot even describe it really when something – changes your life in such a strong and powerful way and i think avatar you know we're older now but i think avatar had that life-changing experience for people especially for people now who care about climate change and and youngsters who want to do something you youngsters want to do something it's like hulk hogan yeah really well i don't know well not not now not now not now in the 80s yes <laughs> like, yeah like, come on let's get on something so it's like you know i think will something like that happen again I could see that with Force Awakens. I mean, because forgetting about the prequels and that stain that, like, you know, especially people who, who lived through the first Star Wars, to see those horrible prequels, like, kind of ruined it for me, at least. It ruined it. But I'm really excited for the ruination to end with this brand new series. And, it, and something about bringing back that old cast and now them being the age that they're supposed to be it's something, there's something magical about did it. Did he answer over or under yet? I don't uh, think he did. I didn't. I, uh, wise, <laughs> I think Star Wars is the one that has the chance to do, but I can't But over under 40% chance. Uh, I don't think it could do the 2%. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to go 0%. Yeah. It's it, like, it's 0%. And, 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 and not even Star Wars. You're saying ever? I'm just going to say ever. I don't think it'll ever happen again because there's that magical mix of, 
It's super amazing, right. but not a lot of people went to see it the first weekend, and then everybody. And but it was so good, everybody went back again and again. Star Wars, no chance in hell. Why? Because so many people are gonna go see it opening way. It will be the first film in history to make over eighty-four million dollars in December in its opening weekend, and it's probably gonna be closer to like one hundred and fifty million dollars opening weekend. It's gonna destroy that record. But because that many people are gonna go see it, no chance in hell. It's gonna make like one hundred and forty in its second week. It's just not gonna happen. If we were talking. About about 10, 15 years, I would agree as far as, I don't know, I, I can never just go zero just because you never know if there's ever going to be another Avatar. I mean, someone makes it. Watch We Are Your Friends does it. You're right. We Are Your Friends does also, it, and I'm it's eating tough. my words next week. But what about a film just like, it only made, you know, it was released in five theaters, and it made $3 million. And, and then, then they next wide, release. wide release. Oh, okay, wide, wide release. Wide release. release film. Yeah, yeah I, I would, I'd say there's a 10% chance. only because, So you'll go under 40. Yeah, I'll go under 40. I, I don't think that Star Wars will do it for the exact reason what you said, is that it's going to open up so big, and then it's going to have, but it's going to have a small drop-off. I think it's going to have a small drop, but not, yeah, I think like 39% yeah, drop 30, off, which is remarkable right. like th this day and yeah. age. All right, that was a long... All right, let's go and move on to the next question. M. Awath writes, Hey, crew, greetings from Birmingham, England. I watched John Schnepp's film and noticed the producer, John Peters, was the one who wanted Nick Cage as Superman. Did Tim Burton have a say or do directors have no say in casting and work with who they get? Well, I, let's just start off with the guy who actually did the death of Superman. I, know, I noticed you spelled my name wrong in, the, in your letter about me, but... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, it's a pet. I do it all the time. There's, don't there's worry. There's no H in there. He's got the H. I don't. Um, yeah, a lot of people don't know that. Oh, and John, I think about Schnepp. What are you talking about? There's yeah. no H in no, no, Schnepp. No, yeah, there's <laughs> a hell of a. There, there definitely is an H. Wait. But the people love to say, yo, Schnepp. Anyway, yeah. um, <laughs> John Peters, as well as a lot of other producers, are the ones usually in charge of putting together the cast with the casting director. The casting director is not the director of the movie. Sometimes they'll be like, you're writing the screenplay, you're going to direct it. The producer's like, I'm producing this, I'm hiring the casting director, and we'll decide who's gonna play the lead role. We'll put that all together. And usually the producers will will select the top three people because of the money draws. They're like, I need this person in charge. I need this person in the lead role so they can open box office across, you know, worldwide. You can't hire this person because they're a TV actor. No one knows who they are in Singapore or in China. We need this person. They're a proven commodity. So it's like a lot of people are like, why are you always getting the same actors and actresses? It's because they open films and they've proven themselves as uh, uh, you know, actors and actresses who can open films. That's what producers are doing. They're like, look, I need to get that money back from my company that I work for. So a lot of people usually think that it's the, the director. The directors definitely have a hand in it. In some cases, they don't. In most cases, it's a 50-50, I, I would say. But a lot of the time, it's the producers put everything together, and, and that includes the lead actor and actress. That's why a lot of times when you hear about these brand new movies that are kind of being put together, like somebody writes a script, and then you hear uh, Zac Efron's been attached to it. And like this is long before our directors ever brought on board. But and then sometimes the Schnepp was saying it's different. Like with Marvel's case, you know, we had we had James Gunn's in studio talking about Guardians of the Galaxy, and he had carte blanche to go out and cast that movie. He talked about how he wasn't gonna get Chris Pratt. He said, What the fat guy from Parks and Rec? And then he met with Chris and said, Oh, okay, yeah, we'll go with this guy. So it, it is it is it is a mix, like you were saying. It's sometimes the producers like we know what we want for this. We've attached these big names because we weren't going to get the financing for this film unless we already had these certain actors attached to it. And then we went out and got our director and the director. And sometimes it's, let's get our director on board. And director, you're telling the story, so who do you see fitting in? It's it's kind of a mix of the two. But was it John Peters that, that first attached Nick Oh, yeah. Did Burton want Burton? him? And then Burton was like, oh, yeah. And then they met. And that's usually what happens. What will happen is a, is a producer will be like, here's five names. And, you'll, you know, if you're privy to these lists, you'll see lists of casting decisions. They're like, here's the seven people that we want you to pick from of this for this role. You can pick from any of these five. So the, it, it gets right. sometimes it gets down to like you have to pick one of these two. And then they'll, you'll meet with both of those two and whoever, you know, mixes. Now for the role of Hercules, you can either have Dwayne The Rock Johnson or you can have Paulie Shore. We're not going to tell you who to cast. We're just but but the, pick true. from these two. Right. right. So and luckily for I mean like with you know in the case of a lot of uh, directors like Tim Burton and Nick Cage got on really well. You know obviously the film didn't get made, but most of the time you'll see those kinds of interactions work really well together like creative forces. Right. I, I'm sure, and it's a matter of stature as well too. Is where Tim Burton will get that list of five people to look at. Where I'm curious now because I mean and speaking with Colin Trevorrow, you know with with. Working with Spielberg, Spielberg, he said that he, he had a lot 
of say in the stuff. I'm wondering how much of that, because he was so brand new, as where you say like a, a brand new character, excuse me, brand new director mm -hmm. coming into it. I wonder if they go, well, you're going to have Chris Pratt. You're going to have Bryce Dallas Howard. I wonder. I mean, that's, it could be the opposite. Maybe they were so good like, who, to Trevorrow as well, because they would like his creative decision making in, other, in his other movie that he did. So I think that it's a kind of case by case basis. All right, what's next? Sam Israel writes, Dear Collider, with the upcoming Batman vs. Superman movie coming in March, I was wondering who do you think will receive more screen time? Would this sort of resemble, will this sort of resemble Man of Steel 2? Or with the debut of Batman and the Warner Brothers comments, will we see more Batman in the film? I was just wondering your thoughts. Thanks. I got to imagine, my thoughts on this right now is I'm anticipating that we're going to see more Batman than we will Superman. And why? Simply because of this. In your Batman v Superman story stuff in the movie, you're, they're going to go 50-50. But then on top of that, you've got to introduce us to Batman and give us a little a glimpse. You're not going to retell the origin story, but they're going to take a minute segment or two-minute segment here. So this is where Batman came from, blah, blah, blah. Give us a little bit more time to get to know Bruce Wayne because we've already had Man of Steel to get to know Clark Kent. So I think there's going to be a good chunk. Of, and once you get past all that, I think it's 50-50. But Lee, I think that first act of the movie, the lion's share of the time is going to go to Bruce Wayne and Batman. So I think we're going to get more Batman than than Superman. What do you think? I think Batman by a hair, just because we. You also have to realize that we have Christian Bale still in our heads, so we've got to establish this. This, this is the new Bruce Wayne. This is the new Batman. So even in the trailer, when you see him running through the the destruction of, you got to understand that he was there. He was he was in Metropolis when all that went down, and you're. It's it's more about that story of him having to put back on the suit and going after who and Man of Steel Superman's already been established yeah. in that first movie right. but it is Batman v Superman it's not going to be so one-sided but just by hair because we have to establish this brand new Bruce Wayne slash Batman and we need the origin story of the flippers don't forget about that oh yes well I mean also we've seen in the trailer they actually do go into Batman Bruce Wayne's origin you see a, a little bit right, yeah. you're right. going to get that right. flashback you're going to get that scene but told from Zack Snyder's perspective and I know that you know Zack Snyder's on record saying I love the Dark Knight. Frank Miller's the Dark Knight. And as he, as they, you know, went from a story session to like Man of Steel 2, David Goyer's, you know, story and his script, and they started introducing more and more Batman. Like, what if, you know, the kryptonite gets shipped to Wayne Manor? That's how Batman got introduced, just as a, a rough idea. All of a sudden, oh, that's a great idea. That's why they took such a long break. They had to rework that script. <clears throat> Chris Terrio comes in. They added a lot more Batman. I'd say they added about 40 minutes of Batman because they were they started going back into the Dark Knight and some of the best stories about Batman once they got Ben Affleck. And they re, they restructured that entire screenplay is basically what happened. And now I think you're right. It's a 50-50 split. It's Batman and Superman. But you're going to see a little bit more Batman because it's reintroducing that character into this new world. All right, what's next? I think this is the last this one of the day. last one. Suhei Brim writes, Hey guys and gals of Collider, I'm digging the new green look. I was wondering with Marvel <laughs> having their own studio for the MCU and having made some great films, I'm thinking most of that success is due to them having their own studio under Disney. Do you think it's a good thing for DC to have their own studio under WB in order to deliver the same quality of films and compete with Marvel? And what will it take for that to happen? Keep up the great work. I, I uh, this is, I'll take the unpopular opinion of this. I, it has nothing to do with it. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. Kevin Feige still has to answer to Bob Iger and Horn and all the guys at Disney, just like they were if there wasn't a separate Marvel studio. It's just that they've organized it differently. And and I'm sure there are benefits to that. I'm sure Kevin Feige will tell us there are benefits to that. But ultimately, it's just about who's calling the shots. And you don't have to be organized one way or another way to have a guy who's calling the shots. And ultimately... Iger is at Disney is calling the shots, and then through his uh, through his surrogate Kevin Feige, who comes up with the, all the ideas, and Iger has to approve it, and Horn has to approve it, and all that kind of stuff. But honestly, the the administration of it, I really don't think plays a big role in this. I know everybody else thinks it does. I'll probably be the un, the unpopular opinion here, but I really don't think the the uh, bureauc the bureaucracy of it and the administration setup and how the org chart is set up is what ultimately gave us a good movie. Remember Marvel was a studio before they ever joined Disney. I mean, they just got acquired by Disney. So I would it be good for DC to set up a standalone branch called DC Studios? 
Sure, it'd probably be helpful, but as far as you know, giving credit to why the Marvel films have been so great is because it's organized this way. I, I, I yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't see it. Shinap, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I agree because studios are all just subdivided little, you know, shingles, what they call them, and Marvel's a very large shingle. But DC, you know, Marvel and DC both just got removed from New York and moved over to here to LA, the comic book companies and yeah. the entire organization just to centralize everything. But there is no DC, you know, studio. It's it's Warner Brothers studio. And like, you know, that's just how, I mean, There's it's the same kind of thing, only the perception is that Marvel Studios is this, they have an, they do have a big studio office, you know, but you know, I don't think it's gonna change it whether they make a DC Studios or not. It's not necessary. I mean, like you said, it's the structure and it's the way that they modeled themselves and it's a team that they assembled and they just decided with that creative branch, that's they, they built out the Marvel Studios and that's the way they, they do business as a, Mar as, as a studio. Because remember, before their, their properties were everywhere with Sony and still are, Fox and then Paramount, and it was, it was all over the place. And then finally, once they had that hit with Paramount, it, was, it wasn't Disney, it was Paramount with Iron Man, mm -hmm. they were able to build and they were able to start, okay, this is what we eventually want to do and they had the business model. And what Schnett pointed out with the DC, DC's part of Warner Brothers. Now they can absolutely put together a creative team, which they have, which, but I mean, they have, yeah. which they have, and then you know Kevin Sujahara and whoever else is running it. And I think that once you start to establish these movies with hits, remember they haven't had a big hit yet. Man of Steel, uh, before Man of Steel, there was just bomb after bomb, and movies weren't working. In this new DC universe, once let's we know Batman v Superman is going to be a hit, even if it's not great it's still going to be hit and i think yeah, it's going to be it's great make a lot of money yeah i think it's going to make a lot of money now once we get the suicide squad and wonder woman once those movies start developing you're going to see more people stepping up in the front and the kevin feige if you will will point out. because kevin feige even though he was part of it didn't really start becoming a household name until like three four five films in there like yeah. Yeah. that's when he started hearing his name and knowing what marvel studios was doing so marvel studios dc team it doesn't matter all right, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films are playing over at our friends at AMC Theaters. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime movie ticket information. If you want to subscribe to this channel, we would be ever so appreciative of that. Just subscribe to our YouTube channel here on Collider Video to keep you up to date on everything going on, on all of our videos and all the new stuff that we're doing, including the new TV recap shows that we're doing. We're very excited about that around here. And listen, if you want to keep up to date by the minute on everything going on in the world of entertainment news, make sure you bookmark Collider.com. Steve Frosty, Ryan Traub, and his crack team of writers over there keeping you up to date on everything going on. It is a fantastic site. Make sure you bookmark Bookmark that site. I want to thank the guy sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting over here, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you when you're not in Kmart trying to get those toys? You know, when I'm not trying to find that little tiny Kylo Ren, um, I just had a question. Like, if so, if someone's watching this on YouTube right now, they could just like go right over here and click that subscribe There's button. There's a subscribe that button that, that you can just click subscribe. Yes. It's weird that people are just aren't just instantly doing that right now. You should be doing that <laughs> while you're while I'm babbling on. You should be clicking that subscribe button. Also, I heard a rumor that doesn't Collider have like a Facebook page? Yes, over on Facebook.com. You find Collider's Facebook page. Head on over there and like actually, and we've got we've got a new contest and a giveaway, a really cool giveaway, we are announcing tomorrow here on the show, and a, a little spoiler, one of the ways you enter is by making sure you're one of the followers of the Collider Facebook page. So just a little heads up, maybe I said too much, but just a little heads up. And where can people follow, follow you online? I'm definitely gonna subscribe to that Facebook page. <laughs> you guys can find me at tw on Twitter and Instagram at John Schnepp at TDOSLWH. You can find my film, The Death Superman Lives What Happened by going to the website www.tdoslwh.com. You can get a digital download or a Blu-ray. Thanks for supporting independent film. And of course, over here on my right, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, where can people find you? Well, you know, John, John, when I'm thirsty, I drink water. Uh, <laughs> um, shameless uh, plug. Yeah, shameless plug on water. I uh, Tomorrow, we are actually doing a special episode of Jedi Council, not on Thursday. We're doing it on Wednesday this week. Mm. So I wanted to let everybody... I forgot know. about that. Yes. So make sure that you tune in tomorrow. So I know we're going to get the tweets on Thursday. Hey, it's not up. So tomorrow, make sure you do that and get your questions on the air. Make sure you hashtag Collider Jedi Council. We go through and we try to put as many as we can. We'll be talking about Kylo Ren, Sith, all that stuff. And you can follow me at Christian Harloff, both on Twitter and Instagram. You know what we should do? Because because there's been so much Star Wars news coming up. We should probably take a couple extra Twitter questions sure. from the fans. Well, we didn't do it last them. week, too. So we Because of all the news yeah. that's been coming yeah. out. And hey, listen, also, don't forget, guys, 
tonight on the Collider Video YouTube channel is the newest episode of Heroes with host John Schnepp. What? Myself, I don't know who's going to be sitting in the third chair. I think chair. it's Gore this week. Oh, Chris we got Gore's Chris back Gore. this week. Yep. So Chris Gore is going to be back this week talking all the things Heroes. And of course, folks, don't forget, we've got our lovely host over there, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you? On Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. <laughs> that was a new note. I forgot what day yeah. it was. You working it out. She's going to be that. Call Zach Efron. Week. Put it in a beat. <laughs> yep. And of course, <laughs> you guys can follow me on the various social media channels on Facebook and on Twitter just by following me at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us for Collider Video. Until next time, bye-bye. We are your friends. <laughs> <laughs>